Many years ago, I was at work one day in my cubicle and letter answering department back at Ambassador College. I'd been given that job of up there. We get, had so many letters that came in all the time. We had a staff of guys that answered mail. And I was working in my, in my cubicle, and I heard from a guy sitting next near, near, not far away from me, he groaned aloud and said, oh, no. Well, several of us leaned back in our chairs and, and looked over and said, what, what's the matter? And he showed us a letter from a fellow written on kind of a notebook pad that a guy had sent to him. And the letter said, I saw this letter with my own eyes, I need help badly. I tried to circumcise myself and I botched the job terribly. <laughs> the poor fellow had started reading the Bible apparently and he'd gotten up to the place where God commanded circumcision and uh, his heart was in the right place. He wanted to do what God said so he got out his knife and he uh, went to work. No one told him, you know, that's not quite like cutting yourself anyplace else. It's not quite like cutting any other, other just piece of skin. He, no one told him he was probably not going to be able to walk for a few days. Uh, he may not have botched the job as bad as he thought, but the results were awful for him, and he was a little panic-stricken by it. No one had ever told this guy about what I'm going to call today the three sweet C's and the two ugly sisters of Bible study. Bible study has a few tricks of the trade, which you really need to know, because at one level, the Bible does mean precisely what it says, but at another level, the Bible is highly figurative, uses highly symbolic language, and depends on what is said elsewhere in the Bible for what you're reading in the lo this particular location to make any sense. And in the main, these are not hard to discern the difference on. Most of the time, if you read through the Bible, you can tell fairly readily whether this is something you should be taking literally or whether this is something that's really figuratively and you don't quite do it that way. Where it gets difficult is in theological arguments where someone is bound and determined to hold to the literal meaning, whether that holds or whether it doesn't. Not many days ago, I was talking to an old acquaintance, and he was asking what I thought about the British-Israel concept. The bee in his bonnet on this particular day was Genesis 22, verse 17, which says, In blessing I will bless you, God speaking to Abraham, multiplying I will multiply your seed like the stars of the heaven, like the sand on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. Now, the British Israel idea is that this is full, was fulfilled when the British Empire controlled the sea gates and land gates of her enemies. In other words, they cho held the choke points, the access points. The British Empire at that time held the Suez Canal, you know, the Khyber Pass. They held an island off the coast of uh, South America, which controlled access to and from the, the Cape, from Cape Horn. They controlled the southern tip of Africa, which controlled access around the tip of Africa. British, the British Empire at its peak had enormous control of communication at that time and of transportation at that time as to who could go where and who couldn't go where because of their sea power. And, of course, he, my friend was arguing that the gates that gates are things that hang on city walls. they got hinges. You know, you open them in the morning and you close them at night. And when it says you possess the gates of your enemies, that's what he was talking about. He said the Bible says nothing about any sea gates. And he's right. The Bible doesn't say anything about sea gates. But the question on this particular issue is not so much what the Bible says as what the Bible means. And that's the thing you have to tackle whenever you sit down to read the Bible. You have to not merely understand what the Bible says, you have to understand what it means. My friend was taking the literal view of the verse, and nothing was going to change his mind, so I didn't even bother trying. In my younger days, my callow days, I would have often spent hours trying to persuade somebody on something like that, but not anymore. If somebody has their mind made up to believe the literal view of a verse, I just say, oh, well, that's, that's what you believe, is it? And go on. The point is that we are apt to take the Bible literally where it suits us and figuratively where it doesn't, right? We tend to look at it. We say, I like this one. This, this says it. That's what it says. That's what I want to do, and that's what I'm going to do, and nobody's going to talk me out of that particular line. The two ugly sisters of Bible study are literalism and legalism. And literalism is this habit of taking the Bible literally almost no matter what the Bible says. You know, whatever particular structure you may find in it, the Bible means what it says, says what it means, and that's all there is to it. Legalism is the overemphasis on law as a means of salvation, a means of creating a right relationship with God and the technical observance of law and all of its little details. 
The sweet C's, the three sweet C's of Bible study are context, caution, and common sense. And I know this latter uh, idea of common sense is troubling to a lot of people because usually the put down that you run into in a Bible discussion when you bring common sense to the table is, well, you're just trying to use human reason. And of course, you all by now know my answer to that one. That's the only kind of reason I've got. I'm not a Vulcan. And so I have to bring human reason to the table. That's what God gave me to work with. And that's what I think God expects of me in order to understand. He communicates me in such a way that I can use human reason to come to know him and come to understand him. So context, caution, and common sense. Context is a lot bigger than most people think. You have two contexts to consider in Bible study. One is the near context, verse before, verse after. Well, no, really more than that. Paragraph before, paragraph after. Sometimes the chapter before and the chapter after. And I'm still talking about near context. And sometimes you have to take the whole book. The other context is the grand context. And the grand context really uh, it involves the whole Bible, the progress of Revelation, what God is doing, where God is going, what does his overall purpose imply, about what I'm reading here, and the overall grand context is what is the nature of God himself. Does God really expect some poor boy from Mackinac Hills to take out his bowie knife and circumcise himself in that way, you know, at that time? And the answer is would have been no if he had been able to work his way completely through all that the Bible has to say about circumcision. But he didn't have a concordance, I don't imagine, much less a computer Bible, and so he charged off on this particular literal interpretation of that passage. Now, to try to understand these things, the, 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 the contextual look at these things, an interesting illustration will be Matthew 5 and verse 38. Jesus said to the people listening to him, You've heard it been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And into our language comes the expression to turn the other cheek. Now, some people are fond of drawing a scenario. I can remember this in a, a speech club many, many years ago where we had a, a, a topic session where someone would raise a question and then it would kick it back and forth among all the guys who were there to talk it over. And the scenario was this. You, your wife, and kids are walking home from a movie and you're accosted in the parking lot by a man who threatens to harm your wife and children and who then hits you with his fist on the cheek. Now, here's the question. Did Jesus literally mean for you to turn the other cheek, to do nothing to resist this man, and perhaps hold his coat while he abuses your wife or your children? Is that what the Bible intends? Now, if you take the verse literally and out of context, come, you know, and, and don't use context, caution, and common sense, you might very well be stupid enough to follow that course of action and somebody get very bad hurt as a result of it. So let's try on the three C's on this particular passage in Matthew 5, 38, and see what we might learn from them. And to get a bigger context, at least the near context, chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 1. Seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. There may be a passage of scripture somewhere more familiar to Bible readers than this one. I don't know what it would be. The old Beatitudes that all of us are so familiar with, and that, you know, if you're a, if you're a preacher, and I think any church there is around is you're asking somebody who's been one before you'd say, uh, what could I speak about? What's a good subject to speak about? They will almost always say, try the Sermon on the Mount and start with the Beatitudes. I'm more, more first sermons probably are given on this topic than any other I could name. Now, if you take you know, the approach to this, you could easily take a, uh, uh, a technical approach to saying, well, the meek will inherit the earth. Those that hunger after thirst and righteousness, on the other hand, shall be filled. And the merciful, that's a different category altogether. They shall be, uh, you know, they shall find mercy and begin to start thinking in terms of the reward of each one of these people. And there's a good sermon to be had in that. But there's something else about this that I think you ought to think about. These are, without exception, 
the kind of people we like. These are the kind of people we like. This last guy, for example, the peacemaker, this is the guy who will come up and apologize to you when he really hasn't done anything terribly wrong. Of course, he sure will come apologize to you if he's done something wrong. This is the kind of guy who, if he even suspects that you feel bad about something he has done, will come to you and say, look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean you to take that. Please don't take that personally. I didn't mean to hurt you, and so forth. This is the guy. He'll be right there. He will not let it sit. He won't let it worry him. He won't let, let, leave it worrying you. He'll come, and he'll do something. He is the kind of person who wants to be at peace with you. See what I mean when I say these are the kind of people we like. We like people like that. That's the kind of people we want to live next door to. This is not, by the way, the meddler who is trying to make peace as a third party. A lot of people look at this scripture and they say, blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, I see. Uh, my friend Bob and Sam are not getting along very well. I should go try to make peace between Bob and Sam. No, no, no. That's not what this is about. This is about making peace between yourself and another person. And as I said, this is the kind of people we like. We like people who are meek. We like people who exhibit a certain basic humility, who don't ride over you or try to walk over you, either in conversation, business dealings, or in circumstances in your neighborhood and your, in your community. We like people who are sincere, who don't indulge in pretense with us. You know, somebody who pretends to be something he is not is not somebody we like. We like people who are straightforward. We admire people who say what they're going to do and then do it. Straightforward, sincere people. These are the categories of people that we like and consequently are the categories of people that we should try to be like. And the simplest you know, way to, way to look at these really is to say, I like people like this. I want people to like me. Therefore, I really ought to try to be this kind of person. The rewards that come with it, I mean, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, ought to give any of us a good dose of mercy, because I, I certainly don't want uh, to have to get what I deserve downstream. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth. Now, how can you take that literally? I mean, there, I mean, any fool should be able to come across this verse and realize that this is not to be taken literally. This is figurative. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? After that, it's good for nothing except to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man. Now, as I said, how can you take this literally? My dog can lick my hand, but I don't want anybody else doing that to find out if I'm the salt of the earth. I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. When you say that, well, now, if you don't take it literally, then how do you take it? Well, if you just consider the context, because the context goes back to verse 1, and from the, you know, the Beatitudes that we just read up here from verse uh, 1 through verse 9, listing all these characteristics of people that we like and would like to be with, these are the characteristics of a person who is the salt of the earth. In fact, we have another, that's another expression that has passed into our, our language. We know someone. And we say, look, that man is the salt of the earth. What do we mean by that? Well, we might have a hard time expressing it in literal terms, but maybe if we went back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, we could find a list of the things that actually make this person the salt of the earth. The fact is that when we describe a person as the salt of the earth, we mean he is genuine, he is true, he is honest, he's down to earth. He is the things that Jesus lists in the Beatitudes and say, blessed is the man who does these things. And one of the great blessings that comes upon you as a result of doing them is that people will call you the salt of the earth, will admire you, will trust you, will do business with you, and you can work with people in a way that people who don't work that way cannot do. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Men don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. They stick it on a candlestick and it gives light to the whole house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, what do you mean you're the light of the world? Okay, I mean, how would you take that literally? I, none, of, none of us is a source of light. We're not expected to carry flashlights and candles around. Well, this is a case where the near, very near context explains what he's talking about. It is our good works that make us the light of the world. 
It is the things that we do, the way we live our life. And basically he said, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. People should know that the reason why you are a meek person, the reason why you are pure in heart or sincere and down to earth, the reason why they can take your word and, and like money in the bank is because you are a godly person who follows the God of the Bible. And they will glorify your God which is in heaven. So again, context makes the point. Then Jesus said, don't think I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to destroy, I have come to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, if you're sitting in front of Jesus as a Jew at the time he made this statement, this can't be lost on you, what he just said. Because with the ongoing, really, division of parties and political parties in Judah at the time, between those who believed in the written law only and those people who believed in the oral law as, you know, the, as the, being the entire Torah, well, what Jesus said was highly significant. He said not one jot, not one tittle, which meant he was talking not about the oral law, but about the written law. Not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from that written law until everything has come to pass. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall do and teach them, his same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this passage gives both literalist and legalist a case of heartburn. Because when you take what it says here, and it actually lays out for you the, what, what the law is, and he says, not one jot nor one tittle shall pass from the law till everything has been fulfilled. Where do you go with that? Naturally, understanding that, and then going back and seeing, go out and circumcise, you know, be circumcised, the poor guy went out and circumcised himself. Because not one jot, not one tittle should pass from the law till everything had come to pass. What do you do with this? If you insist on taking the law of God literally in all of its points, you will slowly go crazy. And there are some people in the world who are certifiable religious nuts. They have gone crazy because they have tried to follow this particular course. The legalists will throw common sense and caution out the window. And this is why these two sisters are so important. These two sweet sissies are so important. Caution means that you don't trust your own understanding. You read something, it runs counter to common sense. You treat it with caution. Now, it's very true that you might come across something in the Bible that runs counter to common sense. You're supposed to do it anyway. That could happen. There comes a point in time when you read the Bible to where you say, I haven't got this figured out. I don't know all the reasons why it should be done. God says to do it. I'm going to do it. There are times when you have to do that on God's say so. But when you come across something which is in that category, but at the same time flies in the face of common sense, a person is fully justified in going to God and saying, Father, I don't understand this. It looks to me like you are saying this, but it doesn't make sense to me. That may be my problem. But you have the humility and the caution to take your time to find out, to ask wiser people, and to learn what the Bible says about this in other places that you may never have thought about and may never have considered. That's what I meant by caution. Caution has a lot of humility that connected with it because oftentimes people get into trouble because they think they know stuff that they don't really know. That's why God gave us Common sense. And a part of common sense is we don't like to intentionally endure or afflict pain. So consequently, when something like that comes up, we really ought to ask ourselves the question, is that what we ought to be doing? The legalist may throw common sense and caution out the window and end up circumcising himself. It has happened. I now know that it has happened. You have heard it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill. And whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause 
shall be in danger of judgment. Whoever will say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, this is curious. Uh, as you come to this and read through it, you find elsewhere in the Bible, commonly, where people are categorized as fools. And you, you find that. You, can, you, you would have no trouble. You've got a concordance. Just look up fool and make your way through the Bible, and you're going to find a number of places where people are referred to as fools. What in the world is he talking about in this case? Well, if you use a little common sense, if you think your way through this particular thing, he says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Not that he's going to be in judgment, not that he is condemned, he is in danger. Why? Well, because that anger that you have towards your brother is liable to cause you to do something very stupid. So the fact that you are angry with somebody means you are in danger. In fact, I might even say even when you have a cause, you may be in danger. Whoever will say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So if I, in a conversation privately with somebody, say, you know, that guy's acting like a total fool. Have I broken this law? No. But if I come up and got in your face and put my finger in your face and I said, you fool, I'm in danger. Why? Because I have committed a verbal assault on you, which may result in a physical assault coming back from you to me, which could put us both in a lot of very hot water. <coughs> Common sense. What this is talking about is getting in somebody's face and starting to call him names and using strong language, which could result in fisticuffs, which could result in someone getting hurt, and could even result in somebody getting killed. We know, don't we, that this happens every so often, that people get into this kind of arguments and bars and things around when they've been drinking, and the next thing you know, some guy's gone out to his car and brought a gun back in and shot somebody. That's what he means when he says you'll be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. What does that mean? Interesting to consider that. What he's saying here is that even an act of worship of God can take second place to being reconciled with your brother. That's a really interesting scripture because uh, it, it, it has such strong implications. I, I don't, you know, none of us actually go to an altar. None of us bring a gift to an altar or anything of the sort. But there are going to be times in our life when we're praying, we're talking, when it's going to come to our mind that we are alienated from somebody that we really need to be reconciled with. It is so important that you should let no grass grow under your feet. You should take immediate steps to be reconciled to your brother, and then you will be in a position to make your gifts, and to make your offerings to God. Now, that's a, that's a teaching of Jesus, and it's really right down to, to bedrock. It doesn't, in, in, in this context, it basically has to do with making peace. Remember what it said? Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, and that's what we're talking about here, that if you remember that you've got something, your brother's got something against you, go be reconciled to your brother, then come off of your gift. Make peace. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, you shall no, by no means come out of there until you have paid the last farthing. What does that mean? Well, common sense would read this and say, in most cases, I'd better settle out of court. In most cases, I'd better cop a plea. In most cases, I need to stand up there and say, Judge, I'm guilty. Please have mercy on me. I'll throw myself on the mercy of the court. Let's get this over with and get it behind us. In most cases, that'll work for you. Common sense also will say there are times when you have to go to court. Common sense. You have to weigh in the balances what's going on here and decide how you are going to proceed. You have heard it said by them of old time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. If your right eye offend you, pluck it out, cast it from you. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not your whole body should be cast into hell. If your right hand offend you, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and that not your whole body be cast into Gehenna. Cut it off. 
Twice in my lifetime, I have heard of people doing precisely this. One of them, I heard about it in a letter that came in to us in the letter answer department many years ago. The other one I read about in the newspaper account. That the guy, because whatever it was that his right hand or his left hand had done that had offended him, one of them took a chainsaw and cut his hand off. Now, I will have to be the first to recognize that a person who does that is really not quite right. That there is something definitely wrong. They are mentally unstable. Uh, but at the same time, it does illustrate one important truth when you come to it in here. And I used to test my students in the Bible. I'd say, give me out of the passage we've read today one clear-cut example of why you cannot always take Jesus literally. And the answer, the correct answer, was this passage of Scripture in their reading for that period of time because there's no way of getting around this. Because when you, you know, common sense and caution would cause you to look at this thing and say, now, wait a minute. Who, if, if my right hand stole something, who did it? I did it. If I cut my hand off, have I somehow or other gotten rid of my thieving heart? No. Uh, if you know my eye offends me because I looked at something and lusted after a woman and I plucked my eye out, is that somehow going to solve my problem that's going on inside of my head? Because you can lust inside of your head when you can't see anything. Is it going to solve a problem? No. It's not the hand that does it. It's the mind that does it. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about whatever it is in your life that's causing you to stumble and to fall down, cut it off. Get it out of your life. Be completely, you know, rude, strong, whatever it takes, get it out of your life. If you have a problem with internet porn, for example, and you can't stay away from porn pornography on the internet, if you have to do that, get rid of your computer. Just get it out of your house. Cut off your internet connection. Do something. Because what Jesus said is far better for you that one of your members should perish, your hand should perish, than that all of you should go into the lake of fire. So why not your computer, your subscription to Penthouse, uh, your subscription to whatever magazines you've got, girly magazines or man magazines, I don't want to be a respecter of persons here, uh, get rid of it. Get it out of your life. It has been said, whoever will put away his wife, give her, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, Whoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of, of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. Whoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Now, the legalist would come to that verse, stop right there, and think, well, if you had a marriage and if you were divorced for anything other than, you know, a, a fornication prior to marriage, because they take, and first of all, you, they, they take fornication to mean uh, strictly sexual intercourse between unmarried people. Adultery is a different thing. So basically, if there was fornication prior to marriage that the person that you're marrying didn't know about, then that marriage is not binding in God's sight, so you can put away your wife for that cause. So literally, fornication is taken literally in that sense. In the English definition, I might add, not in the Greek definition, but he also says that if you put away your wife for any cause other than this, you cause her to commit adultery. So you can come up with a very strict and very stringent divorce and remarriage law from this in this little set of verses. But you must also think about the grand context. The grand context being what Jesus said about divorce and remarriage in the 19th chapter of Matthew compared with the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy. None of these I'm going to turn to. I'm just telling you about them. So that you can actually come to see the entire picture of what Jesus was doing here. Common sense would tell you that, you know, you've got a couple that are married here, and been married for several years, got two children together. However, prior to the time they got married, old Joe here, who married this gal, had gotten married to another woman. The marriage had gone sour. He got a divorce from her after a year. And then after being away for a year, he married this woman. Now they've got a good family together. Common sense would tell you, you don't split up this now existing marriage in order to rectify that stupid mistake that guy made many, many years ago. Common sense would tell you that. The question you then have to wrestle with is, does my common sense agree with Scripture? Can I work my way through this question so that I can understand God's will, not just from this verse, but from the whole package of what the Bible has to say about divorce with subsequent right of remarriage? And when you do that, you come up with a rather different picture. Again, you have heard it said by them of old time, you shall not forswear yourself. You shall perform to the Lord your oath. But I say to you, Swear not at all, 
neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, it's the, it's the city of the great king. You don't swear by your head, because you can't change one hair to white or black, although kind of people do that now. Let your communication be yes, no, no, for whatever is more than these comes of evil. You know what this is really talking about? It's just talking about telling the simple truth. You need to live your wildlife, conduct your business in such a way that when you say yes, people know that it means yes. And you don't have to say, oh, before God, I lie not. Yes, you don't have to say that. You don't have to, uh, to, uh, to put all kinds of uh, cautions and, and guarantees and so forth around your word. What Jesus is wanting you to do is to live your life so that you need no guarantee but a yes or a no. And here we are again back to what kind of person? Salt of the earth. Salt of the earth. You can take his word to the bank. It's good. That's the kind of person you want to be. It's the kind of person you want to have for a neighbor. You have been heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Ah, here we are, back at the scripture that we came to before. That I say to you that you resist not evil, but whoever will smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other one also. If any man will sue you at the law and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Whoever will compel you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks you, and from him that would borrow of you, turn not away. Be a generous person. But what is this all about, this turning the other cheek in this situation? Does that really mean that if you're walking along the street some night and some uh, thug comes up and whacks you on the right cheek, you've got to get up and show him the left one and say, hit me here. Is that really what this is about? Actually, when you understand the context, the grand context of all this, and you see scriptures everywhere else that tell you these things, Basically, what the Bible is all about is it prohibits the pursuit of private vengeance. It prohibits your enforcing the law yourself when there, is, when there are others who can enforce that law for you. And by and large, it does mean that you are not to use violent force against someone when you don't have to for your personal defense. You don't try to get even with people. This is an important thing. It's one of the reasons why people say that, you know, that why police are not supposed to shoot a man who is running away. They're not supposed to shoot a man in the back who is running away because he does not pose a deadly threat to them while he's running away. They are able to shoot a man when he does provide a deadly threat to them. You've heard it's been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. That's really interesting, you know, that God does not make it rain down fence lines very often. I've heard of him doing it, but I don't think he does it very often. Most of the time, he causes the rain to come on the just and the unjust, and when drought comes through, it affects the righteous man just like it affects the wicked man. You know, is there, is there anything that ought to be learned in our life and the way we do business from what God does in this regard? I haven't thought very deeply or very long about it. I think we should think about that as to how that would cause us to conduct our own affairs in the world in relation to people we know who are just and people we know who are unjust. Be you therefore perfect, he says in verse 48, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Wow. I'm not there yet. Uh, be perfect. Actually, there is some question about the precise meaning of the Greek word there. Is it meaning be whole, be mature? But whatever it means, I don't really believe that you and I are going to achieve that characteristic as God has that characteristic in this life. But it is that goal toward which we are to reach and hopefully be able to, to someday accomplish. Now, why do I call legalism and literalism, the two ugly sisters. There was an encounter Jesus had with the Pharisees that illustrates it's in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungry and began to eat the ears of corn, or pluck them and to eat. When the Pharisees saw all this, they said, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Now, this is really a, a curious thing, because common sense would tell you, I'm walking through this field, and there are all kinds, there's grain, heads of grain here, and, and I'm hungry, and all I have to do is just pluck that thing off there and, you know, rub it in my hands and thresh it a little bit like that, pop it in my mouth and chew it as I go on down the road. It's barley. Uh, why would I not do that? It's a Sabbath day? Well, this isn't work. 
I mean, it's no more work for me to do that than it is if I've got a piece of, of, of meat on my plate on the Sabbath and I'm, I'm having a meal, than for me to take my knife and cut it and then take, carry it to my mouth. Does that work? Well, no, we all know we can eat on the Sabbath day, so why can't they do that? Well, because when you go out through the field and you pluck a head of grain, you're harvesting. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just plucking one head of grain. Okay, if you pluck two, three, four, five, a bushel, at what point in here does it become harvesting? I don't know, but there is a point. All I know is there is a place where it changes from just having something, a snack to eat it going through a field, when it changes over into harvesting and something I shouldn't do. What makes the difference? To a legalist, it is the number of heads of grain you pluck. To God, it's the intent of the heart. What are you doing, and why are you doing it, and what do you mean by what you're doing? Because the truth is, we shouldn't have to answer to anybody but God for the way we observe the Sabbath day. We shouldn't have to answer to people like Pharisees or people over here who tell us you can do this, but you can't do that. We shouldn't have to answer those questions. The only person that has the right to answer to ask that question of us is the person who can judge the thoughts and the intent of the heart, right? That's what's at issue here. What is the thought and what is the intent of the heart? Now, haven't you read what David did when he was hungry and they that were with him? How they entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. Notice Jesus didn't make any do any equivocation here. He didn't do any any uh, uh, corner corner cutting. He just said it was what David did was not lawful. But common sense said there are sometimes exceptions to the law. Now I know that 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 terrifies a legalist. A person who is who really depends on the law is a legalist about the law. It's terrifying for them to think that there may on occasion be exceptions to the law. And what happens here seems to be hunger, legitimate hunger, serious hunger, is an exception to this law. Common sense tells the priest and David as they work their way through this, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not that this is unimportant. It's not that it's not the law of God. It's that common sense tells us that on this one occasion, we can do this. They didn't change the law. It was wrong the day before they got there, and it was wrong the day after they left. It never changed the law. All it did was make an exception on this occasion because of human hunger and human circumstances. And God, I mean, Jesus here writes David a, a blank check on this one. It's okay. Otherwise, he would never have brought it up in the context that he brought it up in. Haven't you read in the law how on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the law and are blameless? Now think about that one. The law says you don't do any work. Okay, you're walking through the fields, you pick a grain of corn, rub it between your hands and pop it in your mouth. That's, that's, that's work. The priest in the temple has to kill an animal, cut the animal up, flay the skin, put the fat on the altar, burn the fat, go through all the rigmarole, sprinkling the blood and so forth, and this is not work? Well, of course it's work. And so Jesus said, they profane the Sabbath, interesting choice of words, and are blameless. Exception of the law? Well, a lot of people don't believe it's possible for one of God's laws to conflict with another, and Jesus just gave us one. Now, you would assume, wouldn't you, that whenever you have two laws, that the greater law would take precedence over the lesser law? I would. Which then is the greater law? The Sabbath or sacrifices done by priests? Interesting question, isn't it? And one that if you're always splitting hairs, you might not think to ask and might not work your way through. There is an answer to that question. It's an important answer, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to let you work on it yourself because it's something worth thinking your way through. Jesus said, I say unto you, and this place is one greater than the temple, but if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. You wouldn't have blamed these guys. They're guiltless for what they did walking through the, through the field. No guilt attaches to them for what they have done. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. And then, here's where this situation really gets ugly. 
Now, it's already been ugly. I mean, you can see the ugliness, really, of the, of the hair-splitting legalism, of, of criticizing people because they, they put, you know, pluck a hand of grain. Actually, it really wasn't what the issue was. The issue really was their jealousy of Jesus. But we'll leave that aside for now. But see the ugliness of this judgment of people for such a small act as this on the Sabbath day and a difference of theological opinion about what constitutes work on the Sabbath. That's all it was. And it's ugly but not nearly as ugly as what follows. When he came out of here, he went to their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? That they might accuse him, because they knew what he was going to do. They knew for certainty that he would heal on the Sabbath day. They wanted the issue. He said to them, Which man is there among you who will not have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now, what do you think... How do you think that, that's, that question registered among that group of people? Obviously, obviously, every one of those people in the synagogue on that day, if they had had a sheep in a pit, would have gone to the work of getting it out. That's Otherwise, Jesus asking a question this way it makes, makes no sense at all. So they would have been willing to make an exception to work on the Sabbath day to get a sheep out of the pit. How much better then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. He said to the man, stretch forth your hand. He stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like the other. How much work did Jesus do? Nothing. He said, just said, stretch forth your hand. It was the man who stretched forth his hand, and it became whole just like the other. I read this as Jesus did it. It says the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And that, my friends, that's ugly. It is the ugly face of legalism. And really, what legalism is all about, and it's twin sister, very ugly, literalism, what it's all about is control. There is a fear that people have of things getting out of control. If we allow all you people here to decide for yourself how you are going to keep the Sabbath, things could get out of hand. Things could get out of control if we let that happen. If we allow all of you to decide for yourself what you're going to do about clean and unclean meats, about all the various aspects of Old Testament law, if we allow you to do that, things could get out of control. Now, I know that what I'm saying is going to make some people uncomfortable because I've heard this exact sentence before. If we can decide for ourselves which laws we are going to keep and not keep, then, and what comes after that, then, uh, I'm not sure what it is, must be terrible, must be awful. But let's put a sack on the head of the ugly sister here and bring common sense back into the room. We always, always decide for ourselves which laws we're going to keep. Don't we? Always. I mean, you're walking through a store this weekend sometime, we don't go, and you happen to go by, and you don't have a lot of money with you, you see something you'd like to have, and you pick it up and stick it under your jacket and go out the door. You, did you have, make a choice at that point whether you were going to obey thou shalt not steal or not? Yeah. You made a choice. Was it your choice to make? Of course it was your choice to make. And do you understand that as you make your way through the Old Testament, reading law after law after law after law, on every single law you come to, it is your choice whether you are going to obey it or not, whether you believe you should obey it or not, how you will obey it, whether you will obey it, how you will implement it, how you will carry it for, all this is in your hands, not mine. And it's been a real blessing to me to learn that particular truth and to emphatically resist attempts of other people to put it in my hands. When you're facing with the temptation to lie, you will decide for yourself whether you will lie or not. When you're faced with the temptation to sleep with another man's wife, you will decide for yourself whether to do it or not. The law is there to reveal the will of God. What works, what doesn't. What hurts, what helps. It's up to you to decide whether you're going to obey and if you are going to obey and how you are going to obey. In the end, and I've said this already, but let me emphasize it again. Obedience to God is always a matter of the intent of the heart. 
Obedience to God is always a matter of the intent of the heart. You can fool your neighbors. You can sometimes fool yourself. But God always knows what your intent is when you make these choices. So why has God left all these doors open to us? Doesn't it lead to all sorts of confusion? Well, only if we judge one another. It doesn't lead to a great deal of confusion if we just abstain from judging what another man does. But it also does something else that God deem, apparently deems to be of very great importance. It forces us to judge. It forces us to decide. We have to actually read the Bible. We come along here and it tells us, a man shall not wear that which pertains to a woman, a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man. How am I going to do that? How does that apply in my life? And it forces you to weigh things in the balance. It forces you to think about what's important and what's not important. It forces you to think about the effect of what you do on other people. And so it is with so many of the laws of the Old Testament. Excuse me. That was going to happen one way or the other. There is a psalm. Psalm 58, verse 1. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? No, in your heart you work wickedness. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the, the womb. They go astray as soon as they're born, seeking lies. You make decisions like this. He said the person who is going to be wicked, it seems like they go astray almost from the beginning somehow. But listen to this. O congregation, do you speak righteousness? Do you judge uprightly? That's the question God asks and puts to you today regarding how, when, where, and whether you're going to obey this or that Old Testament law. Do you speak righteousness? Do you judge uprightly? Because God wants us to judge these matters, to weigh these matters. You see, the problem is life is just way too complicated for God to give us a full set of rules that addresses everything we ever will face in life. He just doesn't do that. What he gives us is the basics. And he says, judge righteously. Oh, man, we have to weigh the word of God and decide in good faith how we're going to live in it. Hebrews 4, finally, verse, verse 12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing uh, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I mean, you've got it right there in your lap. You've got a Bible right there. It's quick and powerful, and it can cut right to the core of your being, and it will judge the thoughts and the intents of your heart between you and God. Nowhere else. Your, your thoughts, the intents of your heart, are not my business. Not my concern. It's between you and God. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It's really kind of simple, isn't it? It involves a certain amount of, of trust. It involves trusting God. It involves not trusting human nature in one sense of the word, but at the same time it does involve a certain trust of your own intent, a willingness to examine yourself, a willingness to find out, what am, you know, what is my heart on this matter? Why do I feel this way? Why am I looking at it this way? Is, is it because I want to do something that I know is wrong and I'm trying to, to deceive myself and kidding God? I know I can't kid God. All these little challenges God gave to us because they make us grow. We make our mistakes. We get hurt. We rethink them. We go back to the Bible again. We look to God. And we don't think in terms that God is looking out to get me because I broke some small twiggy thing of his law. God will chastise me because my heart and my intent was not right. Because what he wants is to set it right. Something he can do if we'll work with him.